So a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today um, on the webinar. I'm just going to give it one more minute. We've got participants flooding in, hopefully from all corners of the globe. <clears throat> Delighted to have you with us. We've got a very exciting lineup. Okay, so I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna kick us off. Hopefully, there'll still be a few more people coming in, but let's make the most of the precious time that we have together. So, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you may be. My name is Toby Gardner. I'm a senior research fellow here at um, Stockholm Environment Institute and co-director of the Trace Initiative. Um, great if you can maybe just just to make us feel like we're a little bit more in the same room. If you could comment in the chat uh, where you are, say hello, introduce yourself. That's always nice. Makes it a bit more personal. Um, and during the webinar, <clears throat> I would encourage you to use the chat to share resources. That's always nice. Uh, a lot of the experts are not the panelists in this webinar. Uh, everyone's got a contribution. And make any relevant comments you may have. But when it comes to questions, please log your questions you have for panel members in the Q&A uh, function. And others can then use the thumbs up feature uh, to flag the questions that they would like to be given more attention. So we've got a great program. Let's get cracking. I'm going to introduce each of our uh, superb panelists. Uh, we've got a great lineup, um, each in turn. Uh, but first, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit um, with regards to the topics that we're looking at today. So the EU's new supply chain regulation regime, uh, let's call it different uh, different regulations from broad brush disclosure requirements of CSDDD to this more specific focus of the carbon border adjustment mechanism and the EU uh, deforestation regulation is opening the door on what I truly believe, I think we can, a lot of us can share is an entirely new chapter in the governance of international commodity trade. We founded Trace as a supply chain transparency initiative nearly a decade ago when it was inconceivable uh, to us and to many actors that something like EUDR would come into force. So it truly is um, a step change, whatever we may think of its implications and its impact. And it's clear that the wave of EU supply chain regulations are going to have an, a hugely disruptive effect, they already are, not just on trade to the block, but on wider business planning, political relationships with trading partners, and policy design in other major import markets that may be affected directly or indif indirectly by the onset of these regulations. And at the same time, these regulations are attracting starkly different perspectives on their effectiveness, on their political acceptability and their legitimacy as seen by different actors. On the one hand, we can see these regulations as the EU stepping up to meet its international climate and environmental commitments, including its commitment to the Paris Agreement, leading by example, setting new ambition and helping raise the floor on standards required uh, for importing into Europe whilst reducing the competitive uh, advantage of less sustainable and less scrupulous actors. So that's the glass half full perspective. But on the other hand, we can see these regulations as somewhat unilateral measures imposed on lower income trading partners that smacks to some of eco-imperialism, raises the costs of trade, potentially excludes marginal actors, uh, <clears throat> all in the face of the EU's dwindling market share and potentially for, for little direct environmental gain. That's the glass half empty perspective. Um, and we're going to be able to kick the tires of these different perspectives today a bit. And in the face of both of their novelty, uh, and disruptive impact, the voice of researchers and the role of researchers in assessing their design, direct and indirect impacts could not be more timely and policy relevant. So I'm really honored today to help moderate a panel of such distinguished researchers to raise awareness, challenge assumptions, and encourage us all to think critically, a key role of research, and constructively about how the evolution of these and similar regulations can indeed be a force for good. We have five panelists, each bringing quite a different perspective and disciplinary insight. Each will have six minutes to share their insights and reflections on key questions facing this legislative agenda. And I'll introduce each in turn. And each of the panelists were given four, there's four kind of framing questions for this discussion that you've seen in the agenda that cut across different aspects of how this legislative agenda may unfold. Two relate to the framing and policy development and two relate more to the reception, impact and outcomes. So the first, <clears throat> as you saw from the agenda, is how can business actors position, how have business actors positioned themselves in policy-making processes? 
And this includes, of course, the role that they've played in shaping and lobbying the regulations as they stand. The second, and how are the actors are on different ends of the supply chain, on the, on the producer and the consumer side, responding to and preparing for e-regulations. And this includes levels of convergence and divergence that we can see in these preparations and the significant impact of those uh, changes and differences. And third, how might we see the new regulations having wider impacts to shift prices, purchasing practices, or even the entire geography of global supply chains? Uh, and this can help us understand if and how regulations focused only on the EU market, which we know is dwindling in market share for many commodities, can still have a systemic impact more broadly, uh, which, which and opens the door on the so-called Brussels effect, spillover effects. And fourth and finally, what are the likely consequences of supply chain regulations in terms of human rights, protection and environmental sustainability? Uh, and given the stated purpose of these regulations, this really is the million dollar question. What positive effects are they likely to have and how and what unintending consequences may there be and how such consequences may be mitigated? When we've wrapped up with these contributions from each of our five panelists, we'll anchor their reflections <coughs> um, in, in two uh, in, in, in two questions that, uh, that encourage each of us to step back and reflect on where uh, everyone's real hopes and fears are around this legislative agenda, as well as giving space to your questions. So uh, without further ado, let's kick off. First up is, is Daniel, Daniel Kinderman, who's an associate professor from the University of Delaware um, and has a particular interest in politics uh, as leveraging and lobbying that shapes policy outcomes, especially the CSDDD, that many here will know were so highly contested politically in Europe. And we'll focus a bit more on the first two questions around positioning and preparation uh, of the EU regulatory agenda. Um, so with that, uh, happy to hand over to you, Daniel. The time is yours. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive and the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive mark an important step towards greater corporate accountability and um, transparency. The CSDDD was adopted this year, and the CSRD was adopted, of course, two years ago. Um, the CSDDD, in a nutshell, is about how companies need to manage their risks and impacts in their global supply chains, what they're doing. The CSRD uh, is more about how companies uh, need to report about their activities and impacts, what they say and communicate. Um, this legislation matters, just to support what uh, Toby said a, a moment ago here. It's the most far-reaching legislation of its kind in the world. Um, and with it, given the size of the EU market, the EU is not only setting standards for Europe, it is also the global standard setter, as Anu Bradford argues in her book. While the uh, EU representatives and civil society organizations can be proud of what they achieved, there is a sense of widespread disappointment and anger and even frustration that the CSDDD was watered down substantially. It passed, but it was weakened a lot during the negotiations. What happened? So that's going to be a large focus of, of my remarks in the next few minutes here. Apologies, I don't have slides. I've been burning uh, the midnight oil. Uh, sorry, uh, not the midnight oil, I guess sustainable renewable energy um, here during the past few days. Um, but here are my key messages. First, these standards are political. This means they aren't necessarily the best or optimal way to advance sustainability or improve labor standards. Instead, they're the result of bargaining between different interest groups. We can see this very clearly with the CSDDD. Next, related to this first point, business resistance and pressure um, has had a really big impact um, on the um, CSDDD. Um, organized business can and does forcefully push back against attempts to advance corporate accountability, even in a jurisdiction like Europe, where public interests are quite prominent, and business dominance may seem more attenuated um, or less obvious than in many other jurisdictions. For example, here in the United States. Um, there was impressive advocacy by civil society, um, members of the European Parliament, other organizations, but um, uh, my overall sense is they were really no match for, for business. Um, third, there's a clear contrast um, or clear difference here that I want to bring out between the legislative processes that led to the adoption of the CSRD, the reporting directive, and the CSDDD. Um, the processes leading to the reporting uh, directive were relatively smooth sailing. 
Um, there was some bickering over scope, uh, et cetera, but uh, it, it went through quite, quite easily. By contrast, as soon as EU Commissioner Didier Reinders uh, committed to uh, this uh, mandatory due diligence, um, these mandatory due diligence obligations, there was very fierce and aggressive business lobbying. The negotiations for the CSDD took much longer and business's heavy artillery was really reserved for this legislation. In February and March of this year, uh, the legislation was on the verge of failing. The vote was postponed um, no less than five times. Um, it wasn't killed, fortunately, uh, thanks to the heroic efforts of um, the uh, council presidency, uh, MEPs and others. Um, so people can be happy that it survived but it was weakened, substan weakened substantially over time. It was watered down a lot. Um, the scope of the legislation was reduced. Um, originally, it was supposed to apply to a total of 13,000 companies. The final compromise will apply to 5,000, maybe 5,500, depending on what estimates you look at. So it's been a reduction of about 60 to 70% compared to the original proposal. And let me get a little bit into the substance of uh, the proposal itself here. What explains the difference between these two pieces of legislation? Why did the CS uh, DDD face such a steep uphill battle, a slope that needed to be overcome? What made it so difficult? Well, here's my answer. Uh, there's a lot at stake um, in this legislation, much more than in a mandatory non-financial reporting. Um, can companies be sued for violating human rights or failing to conduct due diligence in their global supply chains? Um, the Commission's original uh, proposal included personal liability for directors. That's a big deal. Um, this was eliminated uh, in the final compromise. Even so, the final proposal makes companies liable for up to 5% of their net worldwide turnover, which really is something. Germany was very strongly opposed to this, um, which it also was a decade ago when it came to non the first non-financial reporting directive. What makes me a little bit uh, sort of um, uh, fearful or pessimistic is how broad the opposition was to this legislation across Europe, not just Germany. Uh, there was real sabotage um, from, uh, from uh, Italy, from France as well. France has its own national legislation. In spite of that, it pushed back uh, uh, quite, quite aggressively against the legislation. Finland opposed or failed to support the legislation. Even Nordic countries, even representatives of Nordic countries uh, were, were quite ambivalent, uh, including Sweden, uh, or, or not, not enthusiastically supportive of this. Um, so since I'm almost out of time here, let me conclude. This stuff is political. Business power and advocacy is really important in shaping this legislation. Indeed, this must be our default assumption, is that um, business uh, has, has the most to say and will, will uh, probably have, have the largest effect. Passing legislation that's burdensome for business is hard. The fact that business fought against this suggests that there's something real at stake in this. It's not just bullshit. Um, you know, it's not just fluff. There's something real going on here. Um, but the way that negotiations unfolded suggests that, um, uh, um, unfortunately, civil society advocates were, were no match uh, for business. And I can get a little bit into uh, other points soon, but I believe I'm out of time here. I'm at six minutes. So I will, I will stop here and hand over to my fellow distinguished panelists. Thank you <clears throat> so much, Daniel. That was absolutely exemplary timekeeping and very powerful messages just demonstrating quite how politically contested this stuff is. Um, an encouragement <clears throat> for questions, an excellent question from Jonathan Zaitlin. Jonathan, if you could place that in the Q&A um, function, that would be great. I'm curious the answer to that myself. Um, but let's keep going. Um, so next up is... <clears throat> Tim, Professor Tim Bartley from Georgetown University. Tim is a sociologist um, in Georgetown University's New Earth Commons Institute um, with an interest, including through the Rebalance Project that's hosting today in environmental standards and labor and human rights in global supply chains. And the focus of his comments will also be more on the first two questions, but particularly as related to the EU's new carbon border adjustment mechanism and the factors that have shaped its development to date and the likely impacts going forward. So some similar questions, but a different mechanism. Uh, over to you, Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Toby, and thank you, everyone. Hopefully you see the slides correctly. If not, someone uh, speak up. Let me start by acknowledging my collaborators on this project, John Murray, Simon Pierre Boulanger Martel, and Maria Trace Gustafsson, who you'll hear from later today. 
And we're part of a larger project funded by Horizon Europe called Rebalance, focused on rebalancing capitalism and democracy. The EU's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, is a way of regulating the carbon emissions in a world of global supply chains. That is, of regulating emissions that are embedded in products or materials and then imported into the EU. Large parts of EU countries' carbon footprints are based on the items they import, which have so far been outside the bounds of EU climate policy. And as you know, this is part of a larger pattern in which many of the environmental costs of consumption in affluent countries are externalized to less affluent countries and often to the most marginalized people within them. CBAM addresses this in an important but limited way. Uh, it requires the importers of carbon intensive products like cement, steel and fertilizers uh, to pay a fee for their carbon emissions equivalent to what producers within Europe would pay through the ETS, the emissions trading system. CBAM also phases out free allowances. So up till now, manufacturers of carbon intensive products within the EU have been paying almost nothing for their emissions because they were given free allowances to prevent them from relocating. And that will stop, albeit gradually. CBAM was approved last year in 2023, and we're currently in a transitional phase in which importers must report emissions, but no charges are made. Starting in 2026, importers will have to either pay for CBAM certificates for the emissions embedded in products or prove that an equivalent carbon price has been paid elsewhere. And this will phase in gradually over around eight years. Uh, Note that the overall cap on emissions in the ETS is also continuing to decline and the schedule calls for no new permits to be issued after 2039. So it's a gradual but ambitious trajectory. Uh, note also that the EU is not differentiating carbon costs according to countries' income level. This has raised concerns that Europe is unjustly imposing costs on producers in low-income countries without adequate resources to decarbonize or even to provide the data. Uh, I'll come back to this. So my colleagues and I in the Rebalance Project have been studying how businesses responded to the proposal for CBAM and how they influenced its course. And let me highlight three points coming out of this research quickly. Uh, first, unlike some of the other regulations and directives we're discussing today, there wasn't a lot of organized business opposition to CBAM within Europe. In fact, many European business and industry associations supported it, uh, at least in the words of one of our interviewees, once they saw it was inevitable. For European producers of steel, cement, fertilizer, and so on, CBAM was a form of protection, a way to impose costs on their foreign competitors and maintain their market position. Now, to be sure, they would have preferred to have CBAM and keep their free allowances, but this was clearly not an option for the Commission since it would have violated WTO rules. Uh, producers fought hard for a slow, gradual phase, phase out of free allowances, and they mostly got that. Some also wanted rebates of carbon costs for products that would be exported, which they didn't get, and they still want. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the chemical industry was worried about the feasibility and was able to ultimately opt out of CBAM, although their free allowances uh, will decline, nevertheless. And aluminum producers were the most visibly opposed among potential CBAM sectors, uh, in part because the aluminum sector that still exists in Europe is dependent on imports, complex supply chains, and electricity. And aluminum producers did manage to get scope two emissions, that is emissions from electricity, excluded for, from the CBAM for their sector, at least for now. Second, downstream manufacturers in Europe, those that report, rely on imported uh, materials, really should have been big opponents. So manufacturers of cars, appliances, auto parts, metal containers, and others uh, should expect their material costs to increase. And their competitors outside the EU won't face these additional costs. In addition, if they're exporting outside the EU, they'll definitely be competing against companies with few, if any, carbon costs in their supply chains. So these downstream producers certainly raised these concerns. They called for export rebates, uh, but they were not mobilized enough or powerful enough to really block CBAM or force revisions that, that benefited them. And we're still trying to figure out exactly why not, but at least part of the story seems to be that they were simply less unified and more fragmented than the powerful uh, commodity producers who stood to gain from CBAM. These concerns have not died and they're coming back to the fore, particularly the call for export rebates of, uh, of uh, carbon charges. I think there'll be a great deal of pressure in the coming years to add some kind of rebate or relief for exporters, and this will come with threats and maybe actual practice of relocating manufacturing outside of the US. 
Uh, but this also puts the EU in a tricky position because export rebates would probably run afoul, almost certainly run afoul of WTO compliance, which the EU so far has been quite committed to. Finally, uh, let me talk briefly about the promise and potential consequences of CBAN as it phases in uh, and expands over the next decade. Uh, within Europe, CBAN will push producers to really decarbonize rather than relying on free allowances. And outside of Europe, I think the CBAN will encourage some decarbonization at the firm level, and it should speed up the adoption of carbon pricing around the world. There's some evidence this is happening in Turkey and in China, where the carbon market is expanding to include cement and aluminum, for instance. But other countries like the U.S. are pursuing different approaches to climate policy, uh, particularly through the Inflation Reduction Act. And it won't be easy to decide what counts as equivalent to ETS charges. Uh, U.S. policymakers like the idea of a CBAM themselves, although less, uh, they're less fond of the idea of actually charging for carbon emissions within the U.S. Uh, the danger is that savvy exporting countries will be able to sort of game the system using existing green energy supplies for exports to Europe, or at least appearing to do so, while retaining dirty energy supplies for other markets. This is the problem known as resource shuffling. Meanwhile, exporters in some of the world's poorest countries could be pushed aside. Uh, Aluminum producers in Mozambique are at risk, although they have some time since scope two emissions from electricity are not yet included. Steel manufacturers in India seem to face an uphill battle compared to those in China, uh, as do cement manufacturers in Ukraine. So overall, I think CBAM, is, as it exists now, is a small but important step toward regulating imported embedded emissions. It's moving sector by sector, unlike some of these other uh, directives and regulations. But as it expands, potentially even to finished products, it'll have major ripple effects. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tim. <clears throat> what, a, what a package you can fit into six minutes. This is, um, we're off to a great start. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, and also for your excellent timekeeping. Um, again, just demonstrating quite how contested um, these processes have been, um, although not as contested as, as, as you might think in some, in some, some places. Um, thank you, Tim. So now let's move on to look more on the perspective um, from other sides of the su supply chain. I'd like to welcome Janina Grabs, who's an Associate Professor of Sustainability Research at the University of Basel, with an interest in sustainability governance of global agri-food value change, and especially in the tropics. And Janina will focus more on the second and third questions that we've posed around both the preparations on each end of the supply chain, but also prospects of compliance from 2025 um, and the potential for the wider fallout and spillover effects of these regulations on supply chains elsewhere. Um, the floor is yours, Janina, over to you. All right, so thank you so much. Um, and yeah, as uh, as you said, we'll, I'll talk about the EUDR, especially in the global coffee value chain. So I'll make um, a brief introduction to the EUDR um, for those of you who are not as familiar with it. So this regulation prohibits the import, handling, and export of products associated with deforestation after 20 20 in uh, the EU common market. So it focuses on seven so-called forest risk commodities of which coffee is one. And it was passed in June last year while well, it entered into force then. And there is a one and a half year transition period that is ending now in December, after which companies will have to be compliant with the following requirements whenever they provide a shipment into or outside of the EU market, they'll have to add a full list of geolocation points of all of the plots of land that the particular commodity came from. They have to do a risk assessment to ensure that these commodities are both deforestation free, so not produced on land deforested after 2020, but also compliant with local laws. Um, they'll have to do risk mitigation and finally add a due diligence statement that ensures no or negligible risk of non-compliance for each of these shipments. If they are found to be non-compliant, maximum fines are 4% of total annual EUI turnover, which especially for trading companies in the midstream is really a lot of money because they have very high turnover and relatively low profit margins. So this is really a, uh, a law that is concerning to them. And so I have been looking at how companies and other actors are preparing for this since last year when it was passed. And I draw on interviews for um, the, the findings that I'll present and I'll focus on three key messages. And I guess one overarching message that binds these together, which is um, building on my fellow panelists views, 
that the politics don't stop, they continue in the implementation phase and that uh, compliance implementation uh, is oftentimes shaped by actors' interests and companies' interests. And so um, the first thing that I wanna share is that um, there, after the sector was basically um, surprised by being included in this legislation, there was a general sense of, okay, tell us what we need to do and we will do it. But there has been such a lack of specific guidance and answers to specific questions about interpretation from the commission side that this has led to a lot of frustration, a lot of procrastination as well. Last year, a lot of actors were sort of dragging their feet and getting ready despite this short time frame because they were trying to wait and see what they really needed to do and had this feeling that these are really impossible targets and let's see how much time and efforts we should invest in trying to meet them. Um, this picture has, well, the guidance is still not there, but this year now um, actors are trying to shuffle into, into compliance and are taking on more and more ownership of trying to define what they think compliance is themselves given this vacuum of guidance from the EU side. And in that context, um, I'm seeing a lot of actors trying to define compliance in a way that makes competitive sense for them. And um, at least in the short term, compliance is seen in the midstream, especially amongst trading companies as a competitive advantage that may make them stand out, um, gain market share, gather premiums in the market from their buyers, because um, especially large trading companies that have a lot of foothold on the ground that have resources invested that have already been managing farmer groups certifications etc have the ability to provide this traceability requirements and that assurance requirements at a relatively lower investment cost than others that have to build these systems up um, by themselves right so they see this as a competitive advantage which also means that um, there's been initial but very slow efforts at pre-competitive collaboration at pooling resources. And this means that on the ground, there's a lot of duplication of efforts. The same farmers are being mapped time and again by different actors, rather than trying to map everybody in order to ensure um, farmer inclusion. So lastly, um, what we're seeing now crystallizing is three different implementation pathways. So the first one is this trader-led supply chain approach, aiming for these fully traceable supply chains that only cover a share of their overall supply, the share that is the easiest to uh, make deforestation free, meaning these are the farmers that have been certified before, farmers that have relatively large plots of land that are more organized, that are in areas that are easier to access. And at least in the short term, we are seeing choices that may lead to exclusion of particular origins, such as, for instance, Ethiopia for prioritization of other origins, such as Brazil and also Vietnam, which are looking to be the big winners of this law in terms of being able to import coffee into the EU market. But there's also been a pushback and an alternative approach, which I'm calling here the territorial approach. This has been led by one roaster together with a service provider. And they've been pitching an alternative interpretation where they could make entire countries or regions deforestation free, quote unquote, in meaning that if they find coffee plots that are now associated to deforestation, that coffee would be uprooted, um, something else would be planted and therefore all of the coffee that comes out of that country or region is de facto deforestation free. This has the advantage of requiring less efforts of traceability and being sort of more inclusive of smallholder farmers. Um, but on the other hand, it also raises important sort of collective action problems and um, uh, questions on producer choices on the ground. At currently, there is, I think, six or seven origins that have created memorands of understanding with them and are implementing this. And finally, um, other countries are also trying to bottom up create country level databases to create fully full producer mapping and traceability, but these are very, very slow in gathering steam and so will likely be more of a midterm solution. So thank you so much and um, I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks so much, Janina. Um, really insightful and helpful. Um, the EUDR work, of course, is much closer to what we're doing uh, in Trace, but um, I'm always delighted to learn uh, to learn new things and certainly can re resonate with the vacuum of guidance and, and the space that gives for, 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 for gaming the system or finding uh, finding individual solutions.
Thank you so much. So let's move on. This is just a wonderful palette of, of provocations and insights uh, packed into one hour. So fourth, um, welcome Maria Therese Gustafsson, uh, who helped organize this, this, this wonderful webinar. Uh, Maria Therese is an associate professor in political science at Stockholm University, also working through the Rebalance Project together with Tim uh, <clears throat> on the implementation of interests around the implementation of human rights and environmental due diligence. Uh, and today, Maria Therese will draw on her work in Brazil. We will focus more on the last two questions that we've posed. Um, and in particular, bringing more of a bottom-up perspective on how civil society is engaging in this agenda, uh, which is very active in, uh, to help deliver on, on, on overall positive impacts. Maria Therese, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, Toby. Um, so today I will share some insights, as you mentioned, from the work in Brazil that I've carried out together with my colleague, Anna chilling vaca -Flor. And I will, as, as you mentioned, shift the focus a little bit more to how civil societies, uh, organizations in producing site, to what extent how they perceive uh, do, the due diligence regime and, and how they leverage it to, to try to dream, drive real change on the ground. As we have, as several um, panelists have mentioned, due diligence regulations oblige companies to assess and address the negative impacts caused by their subsidiaries and suppliers. And there are several of these due diligence regulations, such as the UDR, the CSDD, and the also the national legislations in Germany and France. I will not refer to any systematically analyze as one one of these law but refers to examples relating to all of these laws that are sort of part of the due diligence regime that civil society organizations in Brazil are trying to sort of make sense of and see how they can make use of so it's well established that the effectiveness of transnational regulations heavily depends on the political and institutional con context in producing countries if key stakeholders do not perceive these transnational rules as legitimate, they are unlikely to engage constructively with them. So that's the sort of point of departure of this. And in our research on agri-food supply chains in Brazil, reveals that civil society organizations have generally welcomed these laws as a means to voice grievances internationally. However, they have also been critical of some aspects of these regulations. For example, with regards to the UDR, there has been a criticism about the lack of inclusion of international human rights standards. There has also been a critique of the policymaking process in itself for failing to involve right holders in the policymaking process, and also regarding to more specific issues related to a critique that there is not sufficient emphasis on, on equity on the UDR, for example. But despite this, um, these critiques have been the sort of underlying rationale behind these laws is generally perceived as legitimate by these organizations. So now I would like to uh, turn the focus to three important ways in which civil society actors in Brazil have tried to, to leverage the due diligence regime. And we think that this is very important for the effectiveness of these laws. Uh, so first, civil society organizations have engaged in contesting the due diligence norms. And we, we understand due diligence as, a, as an idea or as a global norm that is uh, heavily um, contested. Um, and in Brazil, civil society organizations have been very active both at the, at the EU level in trying to sort of um, by participating in public consultations and different stakeholder dialogues and webinars to try to sort of insert their ideas of what due diligence should mean. And despite these efforts, as, as Daniel mentioned in his presentation, that the business perspective have, have been much more influential in, in actually influencing the, the institutional design of the laws. But also there has been a, a sort of push for in Brazil to, to adopt uh, legislation and they have been very active in the National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights. And in response to what they perceived as a too sort of business friendly plan, they developed their own legislative proposal on business and human rights that include several important demands that were in the end excluded from the EU regulations. And these are 
questions that matter a lot for victims of, of corporate abuses, such as um, addressing the power imbalances between right holders and companies, access to remedy for victims, and the reversal, reversal of burden of proof. And this is an, a very important example of how civil society tried to sort of, um, from a bottom-up perspective, influence, even though this legislative proposal might not be adopted in the end. Second, civil society have, have played a very important role and um, in improving traceability and data collection in knowledge production. Um, and they, and, and a quite interesting example is the involvement of Brazilian CSOs in the establishment of a social observatory to make it easier to hold non-compliant companies accountable. The EU has, in relation to support the implementation of the UDR, committed to um, develop a forest observatory and provide data on deforestation. Uh, but the UDR and other due diligence regulation are also, of course, covering the human rights dimensions. Uh, the UDR requires companies to follow national legislation, including human rights um, legislation. But there is, in practice, often a lack of data on crucial issues such as land tenure, modern slavery, which creates a risk that companies will overlook these issues in, uh, in, in their due diligence systems. Therefore, this initiative is very important for visualizing, um, visibilizing issues that can be easily overlooked otherwise. And finally, civil society's engagement uh, in holding companies accountable in, in different ways, such as information campaigns, the using of grievance mechanism of the companies, or, or filing lawsuits in European court. There are currently three uh, lawsuits in, in relation to the French duty of vigilance law from Brazil. Uh, there are currently in Brazil numerous training sessions and workshops on due diligence and how to file complaints. And while these are civil society organizations highlight that these are important opportunities to spotlight corporate misconduct, they are also aware of the challenges associated with transnational lawsuits, such as the burden of proof resting on the victims. So to conclude, uh, despite um, critique of shortcoming in the institutional design of due diligence laws, these laws are also seen as creating opportunities for civil society organizations. They can name and shame companies, take legal action, and bring visibility to local issues such as land rights that are often overlooked at the other side of the supply chain. However, assuming this role is also demanding, and in many countries, um, unlike Brazil, is perhaps an, an unique case in that way due to its sort of strong civil society organization with strong networks. But in many other countries, civil society organizations may lack the resources and organizational strength to effectively carry out this work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Maria Therese. Um, another wonderful contribution, and, and it just is a clear demonstration of just quite how much uh, emphasis and expectation and, and kind of heavy lifting has been done and will still be done by civil society organizations in so many aspects uh, of, 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 of the, this regulatory agenda and its fallout. Um, so moving on to our final panelist, last but very much not least, I'd like to welcome Professor Suya Deva, who's at Makeri University. Who, <clears throat> Suya has broad interests in the field of business uh, and human rights and also acts as the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to development. We're very glad to have you with us today, so you're speaking um, as you are from Manila. Uh, so you will focus more on the final question regarding the consequences of these regulations for human rights, and in particular, the challenge uh, of due diligence design, uh, the, the challenge that due diligence design has to shift power imbalances. Over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Toby, and uh, I hope everyone can hear me. So um, in, in my Brief remarks, I would like to build on and complement what uh, my co-panelists have mentioned already about the content of these regulatory initiatives out of Europe, as well as the context within which uh, these regulatory paradigms shifts have taken place. I would like to highlight uh, three consequences that I see it, uh, and I will uh, share these consequences from the Global South perspective, just to add a little bit diversity to the discussion that we are having so far. But before I do that, uh, I would like to add uh, two points of context. Daniel uh, very rightly mentioned about the disappointment, but there is another disappointment that is there, 
And that disappointment is that the intended beneficiaries of these regulations have not been consulted properly by the European Union and the processes. And I think Mary Therese hinted about that when she was talking about the NGOs in Brazil and elsewhere feeling that. So we should not assume that these people and companies and the governments have no agency. They are not just passive. They have the right to participate in these processes. And I think that is where the critique of these regulations that is coming from the Global South is that these are neo-colonial legislation. Europe has already achieved its development goals. It has already succeeded in what it wants to. And it is much easier in a position to impose these regulations which will have significant implications, both positive and negative. I'm not suggesting only negative implications for the Global South, but they at least deserve a fair participation in those processes. And forget about participation. Many of these stakeholders in the Global South are not even aware of these complex regulations that we have been discussing uh, because I travel extensively and uh, many of the stakeholders have no idea what we're talking about at this webinar. The second point of context I want to mention is the EU leadership. There is no doubt that these regulations as a package show that European Union has taken a leadership and that is completely missing even other developed countries in the global north, whether it is Japan in Asia or UK outside of EU in Europe, or we're talking about Canada or US. They're completely lagging behind what is happening in the European Union collectively. At the same time, it also exposes, in my view, the policy incoherence on the part of the stand taken by the European Union. Because European Union has consistently opposed to begin with a process to negotiate a legally binding instrument in this process. That process has started in Geneva 2015. The treaty, BHR treaty has been know it. So European Union to begin with opposed the process and in more recent years, they have been lukewarm, passively in the room and participating, but not supporting that. And they also wanted this treaty to apply to each and every business. See the paradox here. Same European Union has diluted its directives to a significant extent, but at the same time, they would not like to support a treaty or they would like to support a treaty which applies to each and every company in the world. So that raises significant questions about the policy incoherence on the part of European Union, how it is going to take a negotiating position going forward. But now let me move on to the likely consequences from my perspective. The first consequence I see is that these regulations together are likely to force large laggards to act. And when I say large laggards, I'm talking about both and the government. So there are many companies uh, the last one decade and more than that has shown us already that. So it is very likely that they would be now forced to act. In addition, many large economies in the global south, whether this is India or China or Thailand or Brazil or South Africa, other companies, and if they're supplying to European market, Willingly or unwillingly, they would have to do something about it. And we already see some trend that they are trying to put in place some kind of uh, national guidelines uh, to build the capacity of their suppliers that how they can prepare for the ripple effect of these regulations coming out of European Union. So in my view, that is going to be the first impact. The second consequence I see is what I call the consolidation of the business of human rights as a paradigm. Three, four years back, I wrote a piece in which I argued that we already see a trend that we are moving from business and human rights to the business of human rights. And it means many things, but one thing that it means is that these mandatory regulations will create a lot of business opportunities for consultant companies. Because many multinationals 
and their supply chains in the global south do not have the expertise and the capabilities to meet these uh, regulatory requirements. That means they need external support. That means these consultant companies would have a tremendous amount of opportunity to make money. Will they do it right? Because they are also potentially businesses that have to respect human rights. And in my view, uh, there are, of course, different types of uh, actors uh, in the place here. But this is the emergence where human rights are going to be used to make more money and selectively that reporting is going to be used. The third and the final consequence I want to mention is that the transformative changes on the ground, on the conditions of workers, or the protection of environment in the global south are unlikely to take place through these regulations. They're unlikely to take place because it is possible that these regulations may promote cosmetic compliance. Social auditing, certification will come into picture more and more. And that will again go back to my point I was making about the business of human rights. So these social auditing companies, certification companies will have more and more prominent role to meet the paperwork requirement of these regulations coming out of Europe. Because this, these directive CSDD or the regulations generally that we have been talking about today are not addressing the root causes of why businesses are committing human rights abuses. They are not addressing the power imbalances between the workers. They're not talking about the collective bargaining and the lack of independent trade unions. They're not talking about the awareness about these rights of these workers and all that. And more importantly, they are not talking about the inherently exploitative business models. And I'm here in Manila, you mentioned, Toby, because there is a major global assembly taking place. This is about fighting inequality. So the systemic business models which are exploiting the supplier chains and adopting irresponsible business practices, not paying adequate amount of profit of the share of the profit to the supplying company, supply chain co companies in the global south is inherently problematic. And I don't think these regulations are trying to address these road causes. I will stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Soya. Your connection cut out a tiny bit, but we managed to hear I think 98% of that and a very powerful set of observations <clears throat> borne out from your experience. Thank you so much. Wow, what a panel. Uh, so we need another hour now for discussion, but to try and help distill um, some key takeaways, we thought it's interesting if I challenge each panelist to think of the one uh, greatest hope they have for this regulatory agenda, whether it's direct or indirect, and the one greatest fear that they have. I think we've definitely heard more fears than hopes so far. I'm not going to try and attempt to distill the rich comments that have been made, but I'm going to turn to the panelists to ask them to try and drill down. If people to take away one thing on the on, on the positive and on the negative, uh, what would it be? Maybe we just go in the same running order uh, and kick off with you, Daniel, and try and keep it to one minute each, please, to leave a little time for some of the audience questions. I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. I mean, these are fast, fascinating presentations from my fellow panelists here. I've learned a lot from you in the last few minutes here. Um, my, my thought regarding just the politics of the um, CSDD here is, um, is this going to lead to some real, you know, to, to, is this going to have a real impact here? Um, some, some real impact, some positive, is it going to move the needle a bit? I think that's my hope, is it will. Um, I think, and because there's not, I think if you look carefully at the text, there are some, uh, there are some good things in there, right? Potentially, at least, um, in spite of many, many problems. So I think my hope is it will be to lead to real progress. My fear, however, is very serious, namely, um, it won't. It will lead to a uh, box ticking cosmetic com um, compliance or cynicism. If this is all that a heroic commission, very uh, valiant efforts, political efforts by MEPs, by civil society actors, by others, and if they weren't able to achieve much, then we can give up. I mean, not we shouldn't. Clearly, we shouldn't give up. But I mean, then there's not that much hope left, right? So I think it could lead to real cynicism if this doesn't actually materialize and and, and move the needle at all. I'll, I'll stop there. That's all that occurs, uh, Thank, occurs to me. Thank, right now. Thanks, Daniel. Let me push you a little. Does your hope outweigh your fear? Or the other way around? We always need to remain hopeful. 
I, I truly do. We should not ever be cynicism, uh, cynical or, I mean, I think this is just, but that's more, I don't think that's an academic question. This is a different. It's point. not, it's, that's not, not, it's that not. That doesn't rely on social scientific uh, findings here. My, my response <clears throat> to the question yeah. here. No, but it, that, no, but I appreciate you sticking your neck out a bit because it's all, people always appreciate hearing uh, what researchers, you know, think as a human, as a, as, you know, a more emotional answer also has its relevance. Uh, Tim, over to you. I'll, I'll be brief. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to start with my fear about CBAM, which is that it becomes mainly a bookkeeping ex exercise, and that there's a growing list of exceptions for producers within Europe that really should be decarbonizing. But I'm going to end with my hope, which I thought about I think in a new way as a result of this panel. I mean, I hope that the concerns about injustice that uh, Surya mentioned and that have hung over some of these presentations actually spur mobilization for meaningful decarbonization around the world with funding from the EU that is not necessarily provided so far, but could be, and with pressure from civil society groups uh, around the world for meaningful and just forms of decarbonization. Excellent. I'm very glad we're doing this exercise, challenging as it is. Uh, Janina, you're up, hope and fear. Sure. Um, so I come from a context of studying mainly private governance, where we saw that they're quite limited, also because there's not many consequences when things go wrong. And so my hope would be that this suite of legislations changes the cost benefit dynamics of companies, especially if they are truly enforced and the fines come down and the, the perspective of being liable changes the investments that companies want to make and also truly as Surya was mentioning, maybe change the way that they're thinking about working with their suppliers and actually improving conditions on the ground in more cooperative ways. My fear is, come again from a business perspective and with the EUDR as a focus, is that um, the costliness of the implementation, even implementation cosmetically on the book, will lead to consolidation and further consolidation of supply chains, a uh, growth of large businesses and the uh, loss of SMEs, especially also on the exporting side in producing countries in a way that would then create even more producer reliance on few actors to actually access the export markets that they need. So I hope that won't happen. Thanks very much, Janina. Um, let's move along to um, Maria Therese. Could you share your hope and, and fear, your greatest hope, your greatest fear? Okay, thank you, Toby. I, I think my, my greatest hope it would be that human rights and environmental due diligence contribute to somehow change the relationship between business, state and society, and that um, the political contestations surrounding these laws contribute to spread awareness that companies have responsibility beyond profit making, and that Avoid human rights and environmental abuse, abuses is not just something that is voluntary for a few well-known brands, but actually a responsibility for companies. Uh, my greatest fear is that in, I don't think that this is very realistic, and I hope that in 10, my greatest fear is that in 10 years, we will not be so, so far from where we are now. There are so many challenges that we have heard of from uh, for the e effective implementation of these laws, not the least the institutional design of these laws, and people need to be aware of the existence in these laws. And I know in other countries where I've been working, besides from Brazil, uh, when you go to grassroots organizations, they are really not aware of this, and you don't <clears> have <throat> transnational linkages and, and NGOs that work on this topic. So I think it's a it's a risk that we put now an enormous effort to prepare for the implementation of these laws, but at the same time that there are so many loopholes for companies comply to comply in, in a symbolic manner, and in the end it might not um, in the risk there is a risk that we perhaps focus too much on the due, due diligence, which might come at the cost of other more important approaches or initiatives. Thank you very much, Maria Therese. And Suya, um, over to you. You gave um, a fairly damning indictment and clear fears, but maybe you can give us a little hope as well. Or maybe Definitely. Not. I mean, my hope is 
my hope is that um, these regulations will create uh, the new global rules of the game. Milton Friedman talked about rules of the game. And I think we need new rules of the game that protect both people and the planet. And I hope these regulations will move us in this direction. I also hope that these regulations move us towards beyond compliance approach of companies and they start collaborating in the real sense. Because if we can collaborate together, we can definitely achieve the real intention behind these regulations. And, and that would only happen, I am a lawyer myself, but I would say it, if lawyers take back seat, because lawyers often focus on the technical compliance with regulations, and that could be the problematic aspect in my view, the legal counsels advising companies. My fear already hinted is about de-risking. Both companies in European Union, as well as suppliers, may think that instead of exporting to Europe, why should not we start exporting to Africa or elsewhere where there are no such regulations? So de-risking or the global, global, south, south, more evasion of the regulations is a real risk. And that is where I think we need global rules of the game together and we need to collaborate working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Suya. I'm going to try and squeeze in. There's, there's, a, there's some really interesting questions and some answers have already been given. I want to pick off the last one to yourself, Suya. You started to answer it and be very, very um, pithy in your answer if you could. Um, the question from Margarita, which is, you know, if not these uh, laws, then which? And you speak to the need for new global rules of the game. Do you see, uh, how much scope do you see, I suppose, for uh, changing, amending uh, the existing legislations to Maureen's follow-up um, uh, qu qu question. Um, yeah, I think versus be... versus re reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I think it will be very difficult to change uh, the directive of these regulations because uh, when adopting these regulations was not easy, as highlighted by my panelists. You know, there was serious backlash mm -hmm. on the part of the. It, it is like talking about in 2025, let us say next year, that we should yeah. revise the UN guiding principles. If we open the UN guiding principles for, for revision, they might get worse yeah. because we see a lot of regressive and lobbying against them. So I don't think we should uh, open the possibility of revising, but we can build on it. Nothing yeah. is perfect. Mm -hmm. We can build, build on it, learn lessons, and maybe have a more inclusive participatory process and global South-led process of regulation. And it's not merely regulation. It is changing the transformative business models that how can we create more inclusive and sustainable global economy in which the workers in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or India are not exploited and the consumers in the global north are benefiting, as well as the environment there is benefiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a wonderful point to end on. There are other questions there, as an excellent one Caroline posted about the role of uh, transnational civil society organizations, which is foremost in many minds, of course, in the run up to COP, uh, both COPs uh, this year that are being held uh, to, quite uniquely in the global south. Um, <clears throat> but so much food for thought, there are real risks, there are real concerns, but there are real hopes. And I think it was, uh, it, was, it was also interesting to see that many of the hopes are around systemic change, spillovers, uh, perhaps unexpected uh, impacts rather than the direct original intended impacts. Um, but I would like to really give a, a warm uh, applause um, of thanks to the, to the panelists. It's nice um, if we're in a, an actual room to, to actually applaud each other, but um, this was a wonderful, a wonderful panel, a wonderful, wonderful set of contributions, excellent timekeeping. Um, so thank you very much for your contributions and thank you to everybody for joining. And we'll be circulating a recording of this uh, webinar to everyone that attended. And please do um, share it on in your networks and hopefully it can spark many more questions to come.